Welcome to the Women's Health Podcast. I'm Anthony Lowe, the Physio Detective. And I'm Marika Hart from Perisphere. Together, we interview leading authorities and we answer questions and share our thoughts to provide the general public with the best quality information that we can find on all aspects related to women's health. Please remember that the materials and content on this podcast are intended as general information and they are for entertainment purposes only. They're not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Now sit back, grab your favourite beverage or do your thing and enjoy the show. Everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Today we've got Julie Granger, a PT from Atlanta. She's uh, she loves working with women. She loves working with uh, female athletes, teenagers, um, as well as uh, coaching physical therapists in in their business as well. She's got many different hats, and she's an amazing woman. And I had the privilege of meeting Julie. Uh, two years ago, over two years ago now, and um, and got to hang out with her for for a day and see just the amazing stuff that she's doing. So thank you for coming on the podcast, Julie. Thank you guys for having me. I'm so excited. Thank you, and of course we've got Marika there in Perth. Um, it's nice and early for us. <laughs> uh, I, I may or may not be speaking eloquently this morning. <laughs> It's wonderful. It matter, that... It's all about Julie. Julie is going to be That's sprinkling it. her wisdom on us this morning, and I'm just going yeah. to sit here and and be blown away. I'm really, it's, I'm really excited. No time, in, no time in my world. So hopefully, I'm eloquent. I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're, on, you're on fire. Your neurons are all um all up and going. Um, Julie, we're so excited to have you. Um, Anthony and I've been talking about having you on for quite a while, and we just had to kind of get our timing and everything. Um, yeah. You know, all, all the stars aligned, but we're really excited to. To have you on the show because you think you're doing incredible work and there's it, it feels I don't know it feels to me like there's not a lot of people sort of sitting in this in this space um yeah. especially especially who are out and about and, and virtual and online and, and sharing all this information which is incredible um but I think it would be it'd be amazing just to hear a little bit about your background and your story and I think you have a pretty incredible story to share with our audience if if that's okay yeah I'd love to so I grew up as a really competitive swimmer. I swam in college at Duke University here. And, you know, even in high school, middle school, college, I was always in the training room. I was always in the doctor's office, uh, you know, kind of the athlete who was always injured, always sick. Um, something was always going on. And notably, that inspired me to want to do something in the medical field. Since I spent enough time there, I figured I may as well get paid for it. So I went to PT school and knew right wanted to work with female athletes. That was just a, a, a dead set decision before I even stepped foot in school and uh, graduated from school. And I kind of designed my own residency, so to speak. I didn't find that I fit into any of the traditional American residency programs because I knew I wanted to blend sports, women's health, orthopedics and pediatrics and really focus on teenage girls holistically. And there was really nothing out there for that. As you said, I kind of sit in this space where nobody is. Um, and I really kind of built my career around that and started really honing in on working with teenage athlete girls and, and non-athlete girls as well, teenagers. Um, and eventually opened up my own private practice and as I opened up my own private practice, incidentally, I was also going through treatment for an extremely rare form of cancer because, you know, I hadn't had enough doctor's offices in my life. I needed some more and um, went through a really big surgery, um, a 10 hour surgery for, to take out a grapefruit sized tumor that was in my lung. It's a rare sarcoma. And they had to remove four ribs, part of my collarbone, part of my sternum, um, my phrenic nerve. So half of my diaphragm is paralyzed. Um, and they put in some titanium struts to reinforce my rib cage. Unfortunately, I broke one, so I had to have those removed. Um, and I actually, it's possible I might have to have some put back in just to give me some structural support. We just found out. So a little bit of a health adventure as I built a practice, <laughs> uh, to put it lightly. Wow. And so how long ago was this, Julie? Uh, three years ago. Oh, really three and a half years ago is when I opened my practice and when I was diagnosed and, um, actually just found out 
this past week, I'm three years stable, scans and healthy oh. with the cancer. So yay! That's yeah, oh, that's <laughs> yeah. amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. And along the way, I, um, you know, as I was going through cancer, I realized, much like many of my colleagues uh, in the U.S. here, that working as a physical therapist is one of those things where you're always trading your hours for your dollars, and there's really so much. Not just it's not about the money, but there's only so much you can do to grow um, a business and a practice before you start to feel burned out. And it was obviously wearing on my health and my mental health as well. And so I decided to get trained as a women's health coach and actually go fully virtual into health coaching, life coaching, and business coaching for women, teens, and physical therapy professionals as well. So that's where I am now. Was that with our esteemed colleague? In, uh, uh, in Jessica the- Drummond. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's a rock star. We, yeah. we had Jessica on recently and yeah, she, she's, Yay. <laughs> she's uh-huh. amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Anthony, that's my story. Oh, sorry. Jump I was in on Anthony. mute. Sorry. I was on mute. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I started talking and it's like, Hmm, I can't see my anyway. <laughs> Love Jessica. Um, why are you so passionate about working with, young women in particular, um, and in particular teenagers. Um, You know, I remember this burning passion that you had and you wrote a book, which I bought and is fantastic. Tell us about that, that fire. Um, You know, I think it's really born out of my own experience of never really feeling fully understood as a teenage girl from uh, just mind, body, and spirit perspective. I never really felt like I fit in to any of the circles I was in, um, whether it was in sports, like, you know, I was really good, really very uh, an accomplished athlete, but I was always getting injured and nobody seemed to know how to work with, you know, teenage girls. They were like, when I went to physical therapy, it was sort of this like run of the mill program for adults. And it honestly, I didn't get any better. Uh, when I was in college, nobody really knew, like, you know, they were great at treating the guys, but not the girls. And there were so many people, there were so many things I was seeing that were happening with girls from a emotional standpoint. I majored in psychology, focusing on teenagers from a physical standpoint. Um, I did actually, a my senior thesis was on the female athlete triad in college. I was seeing that happening among my teammates and among myself. And I really thought, you know, this is the time like when we're paving our way for adulthood and we're so underserved and undervalued and underreported and there's so much going on. And, you know, and the other thing is I, I felt found as an athlete, but also I saw as a provider that people get really weirded out about talking about teenage girls. You know, they're like, Oh no, there's a teenage girl in my caseload and they're totally cringing. And it, it affects the experience of their own job, but also of course the experience of the patient and the client. So I decided I would take that one on <laughs> for everyone. That's yeah. amazing that you decided so early on in your career, Julian. It sounds like you've just literally, like you've made everything work for you in terms of your, your studies and your career and everything is kind of really wrapped around this subject, doesn't it? It is. It really is. I, um, I knew it. I mean, I, it's a, for, there was a brief moment in physical therapy school when I said I didn't want to work in pediatrics. I, I really didn't find any interest in that was which is ironic because somewhere along the way I actually worked in like inpatient pediatrics as well just as a PRN job and um, and then there was a clinical available in a pediatric sports medicine clinic where they only worked with teenage athletes and I was like oh my gosh that sounds awesome I'm gonna go do that one and sure enough I mean it was like love at first sight when I was there everyone in the room was under 21 everyone was super motivated athlete and I got to work with athletes from every sport you could think of. I mean, you name it, the, the fencing, like really, really cool stuff. And um, of course I had an affinity for the girls <laughs> who were in the clinic as well. That's fantastic. Um, Julie, we'd really love you to tell us a little bit about some of the really common conditions that you uh, treat or see with the um, predominantly teenage athletes. Um, so obviously you touched a little bit on the female athlete triad or um, Red S or uh, as it's known as now. Um, but yeah, it'd be great if you could tell us just, you know, on an average week, month, what are some of the common things that you 
see coming, well, not through your door anymore, but through your computer. Oh, I still, yeah, I still work with them definitely through the computer. Um, you know, from a, from a mind, body, or spirit perspective, from a mind perspective, just in context, the things that I work with with teenagers are the pressures to be, think, talk, act like boys, like the pressure on girls to kind of fit into this society. And that, that shows up as perfectionism, overachieving, externalizing their worth into their grades and their sports scores and all these types of things. And then body image issues, no doubt. Um, I have lots of patients with chronic pain uh, for teenagers. That's a situation that people have a hard time working with because so much of it is emotional. I love digging into the emotional stuff with people, especially with teenagers, which is, I'm like a unicorn who loves doing emotions with teenagers. Um, from a body perspective, period problems, periods that are too painful, too long, too heavy, endometriosis, PCOS problems, misdiagnosed PCOS, which is very common in teenagers. Um, and a lot of times these teenagers are just given the birth control pill to fix their their uh, hormone problems, which uh, has actually been shown to be contraindicated in teenagers because of the risk for depression and suicide. Um, unfortunately, it's still being given out most of the time. Uh, but also there's many pelvic health problems that teenagers face that are now being talked about a little bit more, at least in our circles of you know stress urinary incontinence, pelvic pain, even, even prolapse. Um, it's not completely uncommon. Um, and then from like a spiritual perspective, girls are told not to show their feelings, right? They're often told to be nice and kind. And so many of my clients that I see are sort of the empath and the feeler type. And they are actually suffering from like a spiritual emotional perspective because they're, they're squashing their, their, their own hearts. And so we do a lot of work on that as well in the, the coaching work that we do. Yeah. That's so interesting. I was just listening to a podcast the other day when someone was talking about how we um, intuitively protect ourselves and yeah. so saying, you know, at, at, for, sort of from a top down, obviously we get to that fight, flight, freeze response, but above that is that um, social response to please others, to sort of talk yeah. people down. Um, and that's a way that we protect ourselves. And I think as women, we do that, we do that quite a lot. So much. Well, there is a tend and befriend benefit that women get so when our stress levels go up when our cortisol levels go up we actually get oxytocin produced by bonding with others and so women actually get this benefit from being nice and friendly and and bonding and so it, it's a hormonal like benefit that you don't even realize you're getting so obviously you're going to keep doing it unfortunately it can get done to an extreme and when it's unchecked you know, people start to lose who they really are. And I love to help teenagers, especially they kind of learn how to tap and figure out who they are outside of all of the, the labels that they put on themselves and all the things they're trying to be. Yeah. It's, um, it's a tough topic for me. Everything that you're saying is resonating. And I'm yeah. like, I got, I got a teenage daughter. And in fact, I'm going to ask her to listen to this podcast. So I'm not going to say too much about her. I'm going to talk about me and I feel like I'm failing her and not really understanding. <laughs> I'm not really understanding teenagers. I was a very weird teenager. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, so, you know, I didn't have a normal experience. She looks much more like a normal teenager um, to me. These, uh, you know, the social, the suppression, the, the, the cultural context that you're talking about, as well as the physical stuff, um, the role of hormones is weird to me as well, right? It's just yeah. not really my strength. Biochemistry, If you, oh, I'm happy to tell everybody that biochemistry and me, we don't get on. I'll, <laughs> I'll do what I need to do to, to pass tests. But wow, I'd rather look at movement and... <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All Me that too. sort of stuff. But, um, <laughs> in terms of hormones, what are we looking at their effect on the teenage girl, mm -hmm. um, on teenage boys, but also like, I've always wondered what's the chicken and the egg? Like, can you, like, I know that hormones can make you feel a certain way, but if you make yourself feel a certain way, can that change your hormones? Yeah. What are we, what are we looking at here? Help a confused father out. Uh, well, 
without getting too biochemistry, and we don't need to because it doesn't really help, honestly. It's not like you're pulling out the textbook when your daughter's in front of you. Um, I call it the hormone factory, right? The, it's really the endocrine system if for those who love science, but it's really the hormone factory. It's regulated by the brain, by the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And around 11 in girls, the, like, the hypothalamus wakes up and is like, oh, <laughs> it's puberty. We need to start producing hormones. And so that'll start happening. And <laughs> some hormones are already being produced, right? Her stress hormones, her pancreatic hormones, all of those are already up and running. And so you start adding in the reproductive hormones and it actually takes about 13 years for the brain and the ovaries and the adrenal glands and the thyroid and everything to start to learn the language of how they all need to play together nicely. And so sometimes the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus overshoot and they produce way too many reproductive hormones and it can lead to what we might call a hormonal teenager. Um, or, and then when that happens, the, the whole hormone factory tries to keep homeostasis and so it'll increase the stress hormones or decrease the stress hormones. She might be super tired one day and then the next day she's super hyper and it's just that I, I say that the whole hormone factory is trying to learn a new language. Um, and then also, if she is that super highly driven perfectionist overachiever, or she's the highly driven athlete who is literally going, going, going over training, all those types of things, the whole language, the whole hormone factory sends signals back to the brain and says, slow down the production of the reproductive hormones, slow it down. She's running from a tiger all day long. She doesn't need to be reproducing right now, which is funny for me to say because people are like, teenage girls don't need to be reproducing anyway, right? But, but it actually suppresses reproductive function. And for every day, for every week, for every month that she's not producing normal reproductive hormones, it affects her overall reproductive health later in life. So there is a there is a chicken and egg. It really goes both ways to answer your question. Yeah. Ah, you just gave me a whole bunch more things to be confused about. A can of worms. <laughs> I know. I like a can of worms. <laughs> they don't give you a manual about this. Whether you get, <laughs> when you get. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working That'll on writing lovely. it. Oh my gosh, you're gonna write, she's going to write the idiot guide for parents of teenage girls. Thank you. I'm Julie. doing a whole course. I'm going to do a whole course uh, next year. So just stay tuned. <laughs> we both sign awesome. up. Yeah. yeah uh, no, I'm number one. Marie can be number two. <laughs> <laughs> your, your daughter's older than mine, so you get to. I need the help now. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, I've always suspected that, you know, I know my daughter's relatively normal. Um, as, as far as, you know, coming from my genetic pool can be. But, um, you know, just the whole up and down, the, the, the different energy levels, it's, I'm so confused. Um, yeah. Well, it takes two years, technically, if all is going well with her health, with her mental health, her spiritual health, her physical health, it takes about two years from the time that a girl starts her first period for the for the periods to like normalize <laughs> to that once a month period um and again that that assumes that everything's going perfectly which it almost never is and typically because of that she can have really heavy periods painful periods absent periods anytime in that two-year period and that's where a very well-meaning parent or pediatrician or family practice physician will be like oh there's something wrong and kind of slap medicine on her, everyone starts panicking, she starts getting all these tests. And sometimes that's necessary, but um, it's a very quick knee-jerk reaction. Um, and or if she has acne or she's moody, the same thing will happen. They're like, we gotta suppress that, we gotta get rid of it, instead of kind of looking at it holistically and from the source about what's going on, yeah. Which is a beautiful segue, sorry Marika, it's a beautiful segue into what are some of those things that can be done about it? Like, you know, yeah. um, can we come to that in a second? Oh, okay. Sorry. No, 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 that's okay. I was just thinking that if we can take a little step back, if that's okay. Yeah. Cause Anthony kind of um, briefly sort of said, talked about the sort of normal 
Um, mm. Julie, could you just very quickly, I know that we, you know, we've, we've got so much we want to talk about, can, but for the parents out there and, you know, the, the, those of us who are dummies when it comes to teenage health, um, could you just quickly sort of talk about what is considered normal in terms of a teenage girl, like when, she, when she'd be getting a period, you know, you said that they could be a bit all over the shop for a couple of years and then start yeah. to stabilise. But um, just very briefly, some of the physical signs and symptoms and things, which we would consider just, hey, this is, this is part of this hormonal cascade and what's changing and your body learning. Um, and then when would a parent or a health professional kind of go, you know what, this is something that needs a little bit, a, a little bit more attention or um, assessment? Yeah. Um, normal would be to have her first period by the time she's 16, 16. So a lot of people start to freak out before that, but actually we don't, it's not considered abnormal if, until she's 16. Um, generally on average, girls get their first period between 11 and 13. Um, that's the average. So again, it can fluctuate. They can be much younger actually. Um, and when it first comes, it usually, I said it can take up to two years. It usually takes about six months to a year for things to normalize. But again, for two years, it's considered normal for things to be really heavy. She may bleed for two weeks straight and that's completely normal actually. And it's really inconvenient and uncomfortable and no 11 year old girl wants to go through that much less her mother dealing with it. Right. Um, but that can be normal because what happens when she's very, very young, she's not producing progesterone yet. She's not ovulating. You have to ovulate in order to produce progesterone, which is a good thing. Um, and therefore, nothing's there to balance the estrogen, which is what leads to the heavy bleeding. Um, so that's normal. It's also normal because she's not producing progesterone to see more acne, more oily skin, to see her hair consistency change. And again, to see the moodiness because progesterone is kind of the yang to the yin uh, for estrogen and also testosterone, which she will be producing. Um, and it's just not there yet. So that's, it takes about two years to learn how, for the body to learn the language of ovulation. Uh, and the ovulation is very important in teenagers. We do want them ovulating, um, even if we don't want them getting pregnant, but it can take about two years for that to happen. Yeah. Does that help? Awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Come on, Anthony, you can jump in now. <laughs> no worries. I wasn't sure if there were more follow up questions. <laughs> um, yeah, like, you know, defining normal is, is important. And um, mm -hmm. that was a that was a good catch by Marika. Because I was just getting excited. It's like, what are these things? <laughs> well, that's a good segue into what can be done. That's a yeah, great, that I mean, normal is a good segue into what can be done if it's not normal. Yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and um and you know, so I I hear this is not about my daughter. This is just about all the teenage girls and uh, school and my patients and things like that. But you hear about painful periods, people taking time off school, um, cramping and pain. Um, you know, occasionally I'll get a sense that somebody might be leaking, but you know, it's not the kind of thing that's cool to talk to that old guy <laughs> over there. Um, yeah. That sort of thing, you know, uh, what, what sort of common conditions are you seeing and, and what are some of those broad strategies that are, that are taking place um, around those things? Common conditions like for all types of pelvic health conditions or all health conditions with teenage girls? All health conditions. All health conditions. Yeah. 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 So I'm definitely seeing quite a bit of um, period problems, no doubt. So if they're past age 16, they haven't started their period. If you started your period um, within that normal window and then it went away, <laughs> that happens quite a bit, especially with the female athlete. Um, or it went away, it came back, went away, came back. It's just really abnormal. That happens a lot with girls because now it's very popular to cut carbs or be a vegan. And it's, those are highly correlated things that happen. Um, I'm seeing girls who are kind of on the other end of the spectrum, eating too much sugar, maybe a little on the, the not as active side. And so they're running into things like PCOS. And I mentioned earlier, misdiagnosed PCOS. So girls who are more active and their periods are abnormal, they're being diagnosed with PCOS, even though that's probably not what they have. Um, 
and the problem with with that is they get put on a low sugar diet and it actually puts them into more of the red the red s or the female athlete triad situation whereas the people who are more sedentary and uh, uh, more high sugar need to be on that type of diet um, or they're being put on metformin as teenagers to regulate their blood sugar which is not always the best thing uh, for the hormone factory uh, unless they're in a like a really pre-diabetic state um, the birth control pill is used a lot with period problems, as I mentioned. Uh, it is, as I mentioned, contraindicated as published by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, except in extreme cases, and those extreme cases are for complete menstrual suppression in the state of endometriosis. Um, and even then, endometriosis, the gold standard is surgery. Um, so we, we want to get girls, if it's appropriate, to surgery as soon as possible for endometriosis. Um, we're seeing endometriosis, um, and it's best diagnosed as teenagers and managed as a teenager if they can emotionally handle that uh, so that they can live a life and have great fertility um, as adults, live a good life. Uh, you mentioned leaking. Yes, leaking is actually quite common, and it's not... Um, not a lot of great research, but most of the research does not classify by sports. So people tend to think higher impact sports lead to leaking, but actually it can be in any sport. And uh, usually girls who are more experienced in a sport actually leak more. Um, it's highly underreported. Like you said, they don't want to tell the weird old guy that they're leaking. Um, that's extremely underreported because the amount of shame that's behind it. And a, a get back to our girls need to be sugar and spice and everything nice and ugh, not talk about themselves. Um, but highly managed, it can be mismanaged in the physical therapy world by um, looking a little too closely at the pelvic floor and not globally at everything else that's going on from a movement and motor control standpoint. I'm not going to go too far into that can of worms, but that's just what I've seen clinically and also uh, in my coaching world. Um, pelvic pain, I see that, I do tend to see that in more of the high impact sports um, or just the sort of high, high achiever personality see a lot of pelvic pain in teenage girls, especially around that first period when they have to start using tampons and they're having trouble getting the tampon in. Um, those are some of the main uh, major health issues. I, in my coaching practice, also work with quite a bit of anxiety and depression, girls with anxiety and depression. I really have a love for that, and I really love working with the entire family around that and I coach the parents just as much as I coach the teenagers. Yeah. Even for health problems as well, coach the parents as much as the teenagers. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure that's a massive part of your, part of your role for sure. It's, it yeah. was interesting, Julie, you just mentioned about the, um, the leaking with sport. Cause I think, I think you're right. Like in my mind, I mean, I don't work a lot with teenagers at the moment, but, um, I still sort of think, you know, the trampolinists, the gymnasts, I still have this idea in my head. It's often more the hypermobile girls who are doing the heavy, heavier impact stuff. Um, but what you're saying is you can see people from, from all range of sports with the same problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The studies have been done in gymnasts and trampolinists. So it looks like it happens more commonly in them. But if you look closely at those studies, they also studied swimmers and runners and um, they found no significant difference between the, the actual sport. So we know it's more of an intrinsic motor control issue and less of an extrinsic sport issue. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I was listening to a talk the other day. It was a bit of a summary of the International Abdominal and Public Pain Conference. And they were talking quite a bit about, were you there? I don't know. Were you mm -hmm. at that conference? It was in London. No. Um, I wasn't there, but I just heard some of the things that were spoken about. And they did apparently talk quite a bit about... Um, about endometriosis and period pain and because women obviously have um deal with a, a lot more pain <laughs> we so we tend to suffer from more pain and teenage okay. girls in particular but it, it does set girls up for a much higher risk of chronic pain later in life by having pain yeah. earlier in life and what's come off the back of that is i think people want to want to treat the pain pretty early so when a girl has painful periods or um endo early in life um they want to treat the pain early but it does seem to be still the throwing the birth control at the at the um, at the girl from a young age, which, as you said, could affect therefore the the hormonal balance and, and that ability of the body to get used to um, creating its own hormonal balance. Correct. How what strategies then do you use? So let's talk about um, 
a girl who comes in to see you with painful periods, what are some, some of the sort of things that she can do to, um, to manage that? Or what are the, some of the things that you would look at with her and her right, family? Yeah, right out of the gate. Um, it's, it, it, I definitely would make sure that, depend, I'd, I'd take a really long history and see where she is in age and what her cycles are looking like. Um, to see a, to do a quick differential on does this seem like endometriosis or not? Because if it really does, I usually make a referral to a really highly skilled endometriosis specialist physician pretty soon just to get that ruled in or out because um, we don't want to mess around with it. Um, but even if she does have that, um, whether she has it or not, some really, really easy things to do are number one, managing stress. Number one, actually, I don't, I don't even teach managed stress. I, I use a lot of strategies to eliminate stress from the source um, because managing just puts band-aids on things, um, which doesn't help. Um, so eliminating stress because, again, as long as the cortisol, estrogen, progesterone balance is messed up, that's going to be this fuel that's burning no matter what you pile on top from a like, holistic health standpoint. Uh, the next thing would be to look at how is she digesting her food. If she's really stressed out, she's probably not digesting, but also kind of looking at gut health um, and that whole makeup for her um, because whatever she needs to eat nutritionally, she needs to be able to absorb. Um, and then the, along with that would be seeing what types of things she could do um, potentially eliminate from her diet temporarily to see if she has some type of results. Although... What I find in teenagers, eliminating foods can be a power struggle. It can be very more emotional than it needs to be. Um, and sometimes it's just really necessary and the teen can get on board with it. But if the teen can't get on board with it, we don't even go there uh, because ultimately it sets them up for an eating disorder. <laughs> um, so it, it, you have to be really careful with languaging around that. Um, but if I, we were going to do it, dairy would be the thing that we'd look at. Um, and thankfully in our world, there's lots of great dairy substitutes now and teenagers sometimes are okay with it. Um, and then other things are, um, looking at lifestyle. Um, is, is there any type of things to help reduce in, the inflammatory load on our body? Cause endometriosis, for example, is an inflammatory disease. It's not a hormonal disease. Um, so that would be a really important piece as well. Um, usually I partner with a functional medicine doctor with period pain or a functional or holistic gynecologist, depending on her age. And they help out with supplements and usually girls will take things like zinc or magnesium, turmeric, things like that to kind of help with painful periods as well. Yeah. Sorry. There's a lot to think about there. Cause you know, mm -hmm. I wonder how much am I the problem? Um, <laughs> not that it's about me, but I've got a teenage daughter. Yeah. And, um, you know, you said eliminate stress. I'm not sure if I can be eliminated. Like that would be. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that sounds like a fun challenge. <laughs> Just mute yourself. It can Angie. be, trust me. Just it's mute yourself, really Anthony, walk around the house and then you can't, you can't annoy you. anyone. <laughs> no. Um, it, and I was also thinking about all the things that you said and, and how careful you have to be, because one of the other things that I'm seeing um, is the whole body image thing and, and trying to have the conversation about, you know, all the images that we see on social media and the desire to be like that. And then having the head knowledge, not, you know, I know that's not healthy. And like, I hear this from a lot. Um, I know that's not realistic. I know that's not healthy, but I still want to look like that or they look good in that. But, you know, oh, she's too skinny, but she looks good. Like there's this whole emotional head knowledge fight almost. Um, you know, what's going on there? And then um, uh, how much of the, 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 the reds type stuff is related to that or is it that personality driven thing that you were talking about earlier? I, I just feel, I, honestly, I feel kind of lost. I feel like I'm sitting in a black hole. I'm looking at my picture and if I sit like that, it's just like I'm ahead with headphones now. Um, that's how I feel. Is like, ugh. Give me more. Yeah. Take a breath, Anthony. Take a breath. Breathe in. Okay. 
So we've got body image, cultural impact, and reds. Well, they do go together, um, potentially. Now, let's start with reds and go backwards because we can break that down. So relative energy deficiency in sport, for people who don't know what red stands for, is sort of a newer term to describe the female athlete triad. And basically it means that the energy taken in is not equal to the energy being spent. And um, it can happen in an athlete, but actually can happen in a non-athlete. When I was going through cancer treatment, I basically had reds. I went to Anthony's course and nearly died um, <laughs> because I was like doing like 30 squats because I was so energy depleted from cancer treatment. Um, but um, it shows up in athletes and it's going to show up in the more driven, perfectionistic, highly competitive athlete simply because they're training more, they're pressuring their, themselves, they're probably studying a lot more in school. So they're staying up late. They're not getting as much. They're probably too busy to eat enough actually. Like, and they're probably not absorbing their food well because they're under so much good stress and also not good stress. Like they're doing their sport. Their cortisol levels are up. So they're, they're not digesting their food. That's just what happens. Um, so that can lead to, or, or part of the energy deficiency can be if they are intentionally limiting their food. Um, which is much more common in our sports that we might call aesthetic or thinness sports like diving, gymnastics, dance, swimming, um, volleyball, things where the athlete's not wearing a lot of clothing and obviously their body is on display. Um, but a lot of times, and actually the majority of the time I see in athletes, it's unintentional under eating. They're just too busy. They don't know they need to be eating more. Um, they think they're eating enough. They, they think they're full, but honestly, they need to be eating more dense calories and eating more often and things like that. Um, for the body image piece, cannot escape it in our world. It's just a regular thing. I talk to parents about this all the time and they're like, I've never said anything to my kid. Um, I've really watched everything, which is awesome. And I highly recommend that but they still watch movies. They still have friends' houses they go over to. They still go to school. We can't protect them from it. Um, statistically, we know that 80% of girls by age 10 report having dieted or wanting to diet, um, which is crazy. And all we can do as adults and grown-ups and mentors to them is set them up for success as much as possible and teach them that they are not their bodies that the body is just this beautiful thing that carries their spirit around, give them feedback on um, in character traits, not outcomes. So if they win their race, you say, wow, you worked really hard <laughs> instead of, wow, you won. That's awesome. Right. You do, do have to give them some validation on winning their race because that's what they're programmed to hear from you. They're going to think you ignored them, but spending most of your effort in terms of body image, in terms of worthiness, um, on internalized things of, you know what, you didn't win your race, but you worked really hard for that. And that is amazing. Giving them feedback on the process, not the outcome. Oh, you didn't get asked to the dance by the boy you wanted. Um, but you, um, went anyway and hung out with your friends. And that was a really brave choice. Um, and talking to her about that. Like there's so many ways you can spin something. That's what I love to teach parents in terms of teaching them how to speak teenager is spin it around to something about their character. Um, and instead of some externalized measurable thing when we're giving them feedback or talking to them about stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I definitely try and do that a lot with the kids. It's not always easy, but Oh. Um, yeah, you, you, you worked so hard on that. I'm so proud of you. I can really see the effort that you put in and, and especially when things are, are difficult for them. Um, my, my kids, uh, they're probably listening somewhere, um, don't always have very good resilience. And when yeah. things are difficult, they, they sometimes just go, no, nah, I don't want to do it. It's too hard. It's too hard. And I'm like, yeah. no, look, you, in spite of the fact that you knew it was going to be really challenging and you knew you were going to be a little bit anxious about it you went and had a go and I'm so proud of you because you knew it was going to be hard and you still gave it, gave it a try. And that is amazing because a lot of people oh, would just nice. give up, but you didn't. Um, oh, thank yeah. you. For I think that's really important. Well, I think you brought up a really good point there too, that kids need to be taught. This is something that from a really young age with kids, let them fail, let them have disappointments when they're three years old, let them pick themselves back up when they fall on their face, literally, like literally when they fall on their face, let them get up and come to you. 
rather than go over to them and be like, Oh my God, are you okay? Like, I mean, seriously, um, disappointments are the breeding ground for success for everyone. That's where we, we learn that resilience. And I teach all my clients. I teach all my teenagers. There is no such thing as failure. They actually take the word failure. I command them to take the word failure out of their vocabulary because there's only a lesson. We always can learn a lesson and how much stronger will they be because of that. Um, and every single kid loves to learn. They love to read books. They love to learn. And so I usually say, you love to learn, don't you? What did you learn from this? And they're, you know, they might grumble at me, but at the same time, they know that I'm fostering, you know, I'm fostering this different approach and they really appreciate that I say, yeah, that totally sucks. I didn't go how you wanted it, but it's more from they have a really good answer. So, mm hmm just um, really quickly, Julie, I'm really sorry. The internet uh, seems to have cut out. So number one, are you still there? Oh, uh -oh. there you are. Yeah, it's kind of patchy. I'm still here. Oh, yeah. okay, good. Um, we lost like your last two sentences, I think. Okay, so... I was saying that um, there's no such thing as a failure, only a lesson, and really instilling that in a, in a kid or a teenager to teach anyone that. And say, you love to learn, don't you? What did you learn? Um, and really, really fostering that, taking out the word failure from the vocabulary is, is a lovely, lovely trick. Whether it's a, a school failure or a sports failure or a body image, my hair doesn't look the way I want, you know, anything like that. Um, letting them see that they could learn something from it and that they are more than their externalized measurable things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I lost it. I lost the sound as well for a little bit. Um, you, you touched a little bit, Oh, Anthony, I think a little bit earlier about images and the fact that, um, you know, girls are obviously being exposed to a lot of, uh, there's a stat recently and I can't remember how many images a day that we see, but it, it's a lot. And with things like, you know, obviously Instagram and, Snapchat and all sorts of, and, and Facebook and things. But um, when I, I was chatting to a, a physio recently who works a lot with athletes and she was saying, and, and she's been working for about 20 years and she was saying in terms of the sort of recovery side of things, she feels like um, a lot of athletes these days, you know, whereas traditionally they might've, um, when they're on tour, you know, done their co competition and then gone and played cards with their friends or read a book or went for a walk with, you know, something like that. She says what she's seeing is a lot of them, are, uh, their downtime is like completely on their phone. So they'll yeah. spend six hours of training and then six hours um, literally sit, just sitting, looking at their mobile phones. Um, and she said it's, it's, you know, really probably not help, helping them in many ways. Um, is this something that you're seeing as well? And, and would you give any advice um, for athletes in terms of recovery and their off time? Yeah, we actually know that number matter what age you are, even for adults, your ratio of non-sport activity to sport activity needs to be two, I'm sorry, other way, sport activity to non-sport activity needs to be two to one. So for every two hours during your sport, you need to be doing one hour of a non-sport creative play-based activity. Um, so if you train 14 hours a week, you need to be doing seven hours of some type of, with your hands, like it could, it could be cleaning your room, but some type of something with your hands, some type of creative activity that's sort of playful. Um, and for athletes that go straight onto their phone, the problem is they don't learn the, we talked about resiliency, they don't learn skills and any other type of hobby or activity, especially in our really competitive athletes. So when they get injured, they, they have no identity. They have no idea what to do with themselves. So they sit on their phones and, you know, sometimes there's good information on phones like podcasts, like this one, but you know, other times it's just smut that they're looking at, you know, and ultimately they, they lose that, that emotional and physical resiliency as well. Physical literacy, just, they just aren't very well rounded. So for parents and for athletes, you know, making sure that kids, teens stay active, you know, climbing trees, playing outside, doing stuff with a dog, whatever it is that still gives them a sense of purpose beyond 
their sport is super important. Making sure kids and teens have responsibilities that they have to get done before they're given the Wi-Fi passcode. I love that trick. They don't like it, but it's it. They understand the the need for that. Most kids understand it. Um, and fostering activities outside of sports is super super important. I cannot underscore that enough. Most of my clients who come to me for life coaching, who have had some type of health issue or, or injury, are totally lost and they don't know who they are anymore when they lose their sport. Yeah. Yeah, identity. That's, that's something big that I've, that I've focused yeah. a lot on, just in general, but in a different realm. But can totally see that too, you know. Um, and it's like these are the adolescent years, right? This is where you begin to form your identity. You go to college and you challenge your yeah. your beliefs and everything that's happened. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult. Whether you've got a driven teenager or whether you've got somebody who just feels a little bit lost, um, a lot of what, just if I've heard you correctly, I haven't said it yet, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little joke where Rika and I have, I seem to re I like to recap what I've heard. Um, yeah. a, a lot of what you're saying is, is, um, acknowledging the process as opposed to the result. Um, yeah. a lot of it is almost shepherding them through, um, through this period of time, not by beating them with a stick shepherding, but just being alongside, being yeah. there to um, to be present, and yet, um, you know, sometimes you have to do hard things like, you know, control the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> um, right, setting boundaries yeah. is important. <laughs> yeah, so setting boundaries, getting the balance for how much they're doing. So with the driven sport teenager, we're looking at people who are. Um, not doing enough other activities. So, so, you know, you said you couldn't stress it enough. Um, the outside of sport activities, um, would that be the same for out for, for those who are studying a lot, for example, yeah. trying to keep them out of the yeah. library or the, the study room or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The gamers, the studiers, the bookworms, they need to be doing stuff outside of school. Cause what happens when they're done with school? Yeah. They're, they're going to be the sort of perpetual going to school, never drop, never finish school, have 16 degrees um, because they just don't know who they are outside of learning. And learning can be great, but it can also be uh, a weapon that we use against ourselves sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I, I'm happy to always admit when I don't know stuff and I just feel like there's stuff that I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I can only go by my lived experience and geez, I hope there's people out there who feel the same way. Uh, but you know what? If not, it doesn't but... matter. <laughs> um, for, for those uh, people out there, just in summary, I have a hormonal teenager. I don't really know what to do. Um, what can they um, you know, people, people want to put my kid on medication. People want to, you know, see psychologist. I hear the words, oh, you know, they've got depression, they've got anxiety thrown around. And then sometimes I'm thinking, is that just an expression of how you feel or is that a mm -hmm. clinical diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Like what sort of, uh, what's, what else can you add for, for us? Um, in this well, realm, well, the different types of kids that you're seeing. Well, I definitely think it's it's important to not just rush off when a kid seems down or depressed or anxious and medicate them for that either. Um, there is absolutely a place for medication um, in in handling that for for kids and teens, but a lot of times they're growing up in a world, as I mentioned, where it's not okay to have feelings. It's not okay to talk about them. It's not okay to feel them. It's actually wrong to feel them. Um, and so they suppress them. And then when we suppress things, just mushroom cloud and come out when you least expect it. Um, and generally speaking, most parents don't quite know how to deal with their own emotions. And so then they see it in the kid and they're freaking out and they're like, ah, I don't know how to deal with this. So 
I love, that's what I love to do is sort of be the coach figure and, and help people figure it out before we run around and freak out and start, you know, misdiagnosing and labeling a kid with something that, you know, I, I see that with kids with what's been labeled as depression, anxiety, they just need skills. They just need to learn how to feel and deal with their emotions and talk them through and actually use them to their advantage um, versus like, let's squash them and numb them and medicate them. Um, it's, it's, it can be a really sad situation if we don't do it quite right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you said that because that just totally suits all my biases to, to mm. not, I know. it's okay <laughs> to feel, it's okay to feel. But, Good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, and learning to cope. It's, um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good, good. And, and uh, I mean, that's that relationship that you can have with your child. I mean, sometimes that's really very open and easy. Um, but in some situations that might not be. And I guess for a lot of girls, if we are, if we as a parent are not the person that they feel that they can speak to, then obviously you as a health coach would be yeah. a great outlet, but um, also a, another family member who they're close to, who they trust. Um, I think everybody needs a sounding board and that might be a role as a parent too, is making sure that if, if we don't have that, that relationship where a child, like I have my daughter, my 11 year old daughter is so open. She tells me everything. Like <laughs> she tells me everything, um, which is great thus far, you know, that may probably will change in her teenage years <laughs> and Anthony's nodding. Um, but I guess if, if that relationship changes and she doesn't feel that she can talk to me about some things, because there will be some things that she's like, I'm not telling mum about sex and other things. Yeah. But having, uh, having a trusting adult who they're close to, that might be a, a role as a parent that we can probably uh, nurture and facilitate um, so that everybody has, and I think all kids need that, don't they? Not just the girls. Yeah, all kids do. And I, I love that, that you mentioned that. And it's normal for a teen to pull away from you. That's part of them learning how to be independent, which is what you want them to do. Trust me, you don't want them to be latched on and, and coming to you with every problem because they'll never let go, right? Um, they'll be 30 and still like needing you to cook their dinner for them. Um, but I love that. I love when I get parents on the phone and I say, let me be the one who pulls the stuff out of them. Um, I have a way of doing that and getting them to open up. Um, and you be the parent, you be there kind of as the shepherd and the supporter, but not the one who's trying to pry and force and do all these things. Um, that's what they want. They, they want that independence from their parent and they still need a trusted adult to talk to whether it's me or a different coach or their sports coach or their person, their pastor at church or whoever teacher, um, someone that they know isn't going to punish them or, you know, whatever for like telling the truth about something they did. Um, that's super important for all teens for sure. Brilliant. Brilliant. Julie, um, we are going to wrap it up and uh, cause we've had, your time for an hour and it's just been incredible um thank you so much for everything that you've covered um so we've we've really talked a lot well, you've spoken a lot about um you know some giving some great tips to parents on how to create you know help help your child you know create their identity outside of sports and study um we talked a little bit about sort of nutrition and body image we've talked about pain and in painful periods and what's normal and what's not. So it's, and I know that this is absolutely just the, the tip of the iceberg of what you do on a, on a daily basis. Um, can we just wrap up by just you telling uh, our audience how people can get in touch with you? Like yeah. what, are your, um, what are your, your uh, what, are, what do we call it? The socials and the email? Handles. Yeah. You can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at, at Dr. Julie Granger. And then if you want to get a copy, I have a free guide that walks you through a lot of the um, hormone stuff, nutrition stuff, period health. Um, it's great for teenagers and adults alike. It's www.drjuliegranger.com backslash energize your health. So it talks through everything you need to know about energy and periods and moodiness and all that kind of stuff. Fantastic. We'll make sure that that's um, in the show notes and um, 
you know, wherever wherever this podcast will be published, we'll make sure that that's in the pod in the in the show notes there. Um, so people can find you at drjuliegranger.com. Yes, um, that's right. Mm-hmm. And all the socials. All the socials at Dr. Julie Granger. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you very much, Julie. And it's great to talk to you again. And honestly, I would, we, we would love to have you on the podcast again for, for many different, like there's many different topics and we've only just sort of wanted that overarching fly over the, the you know, that 10,000 foot view. And um, yeah. there's lots of people that want, um, you know, go deeper into different topics and would love to do that with you sometime in the future, if that's okay. And, um, and yes, absolutely. I would love that. Thank you. I love to dive deep on these things. My favorite <laughs> <thing>. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll go make sure that I put my life jacket on and, um, you know, read <laughs> myself that I'm going to be jumping into another deep hole. And <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Thank you very much again. Julie. Oh, you're so welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thank Julie. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode. Please be sure to hit like if you enjoyed this episode and leave any comments or questions below because we'd really love to hear from you. If you haven't already hit subscribe, please do so now so that you can be kept notified of when we release a new episode. Otherwise, thank you for listening and we look forward to having you back with us for another episode of the Women's Health Podcast.